Hi, I'm Professor McCoy. It's time for another response video, this one to Wisecrack once again. Uh, I have uh, this time not seen this video, so a lot of this is going to be my unfiltered reaction and my straight out of the mouth thoughts, uh, possibly edited down so I can have time to research a thing or two just in case it comes up. Um, this time, I'm looking at uh, an older take from Wisecrack on the philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien, particularly on his theory of history. Now, I know a great deal about his theory of history. I've read all of the relevant texts, at least I think so, uh, from Tolkien himself, as well as tons of secondary source material on uh, his philosophy and theology, uh, and a lot of things written by his dear friend C.S. Lewis on the same subject. And I'm very familiar with the medieval worldview, which is basically Tolkien's anyway. And so... I know a lot about this subject, and so I'm bound to be deeply frustrated by another philosopher. I can only assume getting it horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, this was, of course, recommended to me that I look at this and react to it because another philosopher got something so horribly wrong about something I care about so very deeply. And so, without further ado, let's uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, now, I will say that uh, this is a different uh, presenter from the last Wisecrack video that I responded to. I um, hadn't realized there, were, there was more than one presenter on the channel. I've only ever seen videos from the other guy I responded to in the God's Not Dead video. Again, link in the description if you haven't seen it. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a new one for me. So uh, let's have a look, see what he has to say. I have sped up the video somewhat, so if you need to slow it back down, feel free to. Uh, if you need to speed it up further and I'm not talking quickly enough for you, or he's not talking quickly enough for you still, I still won't be offended. But let us begin. What's up, Wisecrack? Jared again. With the recent release of J.R.R. Tolkien's final book and the upcoming Middle-Earth Amazon series with a production budget of half a billion dollars, it's a great time to be a Tolkien fan. But while the growing body of work set in Middle-Earth means everything is always improving for fantasy fans, Tolkien himself was of the opposite opinion. Everything is always getting worse. A self-avowed pessimist, Tolkien... Okay, so first of all, no. Um, I know what he's... Okay, I know what he's getting at. He's... I know he's getting at the particular philosophy of history that Tolkien, that Tolkien put forward and that Tolkien is sort of embodied in his works, uh, which is a kind of gradual decline from a period of greatness that can co uh, commensurate with the fall and... Uh, and inspired by uh, most of the medieval people living among the ruins of ancient civilizations and looking up upon them and all all this stuff. Sure, there's I'll be, be able to talk about this plenty more as we go forward. However, for now, I want to note that that's absolutely not the case. If you have seen the ending of The Lord of the Rings, either in the book or the movie, you know that things don't always get worse because there's a thing called eucatastrophe. That things decline, 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 and then at some point, through typically divine intervention, miraculously, everything works out. And that's the crucial part, because that is the story of the world. That's the story of Christ entering into the world, God entering into creation, to redeem it, to bring it back up. This particularly, the thing that he's talking about, this steady state of decline, is a pre-incarnational view of, of history. This isn't a picture of history sum total. So again, that is very important context to understand for uh, Tolkien's philosophy of history. Now, I don't know if he's going to approach that. I can't imagine anyone talking about the philosophy of Tolkien, especially with respect to history or even storytelling, and not mentioning you catastrophe, so I'm assuming he's going to but you never know let's let him continue went so far as to say that he didn't believe history would be anything more than one long defeat this idea of defeat and decline is the very quality that infuses his fiction with such a sense of longing and nostalgia but is progress really a pernicious myth or was Tolkien hitting that pipeweed a little too hard uh stop with the pipeweed is weed thing okay i know it's a minor thing pipeweed is tobacco he says it in The Hobbit. He says it in The Lord of the Rings. He says it in dozens of letters. I don't know about dozens. Several letters, very specifically. Because he was very upset with the hippies appropriating his use of the word when they were smoking weed, marijuana that is, in the 60s. He was very upset with that. 
had no approval whatsoever of the hippies who were appropriating his work as far as he saw it. So no, stop that. Please don't do this. That's that's so antithetical to to every bit of his culture. He smoked a pipe with tobacco in it. That that's all. He smoked a pipe with tobacco in it. That's what he did. Of course, I'm giving up tobacco for Lent, so this thing remains empty. But regardless, he smoked a pipe with tobacco in it. Not marijuana. Whatever. Anyway, um, another point. He said history is a series of uh, is simply a series of long defeats or one long defeat. Yes, Tolkien did, in fact, say that. However... Until the catastrophe, he's cutting off the second half of that sentence. Tolkien said specifically that, yes, history is a, a series of defeats or a, a one long defeat until the end. And that's, when the, and that's when the thing turns. So missing that just misses the entire picture. So we'll see where he goes with this. I'm not encouraged so far. <laughs> well, let's crack open some dusty tomes and find out in this Wisecrack edition on J.R.R. Tolkien's philosophy of history. But before we get there, just a quick shout out to our sponsor, Vincero. They've been massively... Uh, forgive me, but I will... Uh, Vincero is not sponsoring me, so I will, uh, I will skip this. So thanks again to Vincero, and now back to the show. Here's a quick breakdown for the uninitiated. You're probably aware of Tolkien's most famous works, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, or at least Peter Jackson's phenomenal and then just god-awful adaptations of them, respectively. But what you may not know is that Frodo and Bilbo exist in an entire Tolkien literary universe set in Middle-earth. The history of Middle-earth is long and set into distinct ages, with Lord of the Rings occurring at the end of the Third Age and the beginning of the Fourth, but that'll be important in a little bit. These ages are, of course, fictional, but they also sync up with our own very real timelines right around the period between prehistory and history. In other words, Lord of the Rings happens on Earth just a really, really long time ago, which for reasons I'll get into is quite important. But before we get into why Tolkien thought everything is always getting worse we have to understand one thing the dude loved history something to mention here uh is that the various ages were delineated by major historical events um the third age ending starting the fourth age uh occurred with the uh with the reestablishment of the king in gondor not the defeat of sauron i mean it depends on which calendar you're using that's actually contentious like in universe contentious uh, but we can assume, again, that, that these, these events roughly coincide. They were within the same year, year one. Um, year one of the Fourth Age. Uh, but uh, we are in, I believe, the Seventh Age now, which began with, uh, which I think it began with the, the atomic bombings. <laughs> because, yeah, that was a major turning point in human history, the capability that we, not only the capacity we had to destroy ourselves completely and not just piecemeal, uh, all at once, as it were, but then also our willingness to do so. If anything indicates a decline in civilization, it's that. So, you know what, let's just say that one of his marks of uh, of changes in uh in age from one time period to another really demonstrates the idea that yes human civilization is one constant slide downwards because of course it is come on let's let's be realistic especially in terms of in terms of culture uh again not in terms of obviously not in terms of things like technology fine but i'm sure he's going to try and address that and maybe fail um in any case though Let's go on. Again, this is correct. So far, so good, as far as the the Tolkien history goes, but we need to add some things for context, I think. In The Lost Road, his abandoned book about time travel from our own era back to the Second Age of Middle-earth, Tolkien, through a clearly autobiographical character, writes that his most permanent mood had been since childhood the desire to see the lie of old and forgotten lands, to behold ancient men walking, to hear their languages as they spoke them, in the days before when tongues of forgotten lineage were heard in the kingdoms long fallen. This deep passion for history shows in just how much it pervades his writing. There are over 600 references to the history of Middle-earth in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I didn't, I've never heard of that book. And I'm kind of glad that he didn't finish it, that he abandoned it, because it would have done very strange things to the world. And I think he knew that. It's an interesting speculative bit of authorial fan fiction, I suppose. It's like in-universe speculative fiction or something strange like that. Hmm. Again, it's it's neat. But I think that it's uh, 
it provides issues with this very philosophy of time because again somebody coming from from the far future to embody to to, to interact with the with the ancient past It, it sets up a contrast, which is literarily useful, I suppose. But then also, while doing so, it, it it intrudes upon that past, which is not the sort of thing that not the sort of thing that fits within this sort of framework of history. So again, it was abandoned. I've never heard of this. I, I actually hadn't read this work at all. Uh, but I think that its abandonment was very deliberate, very intentional. Uh, so yes, it it, it does perhaps show his view of the world uh, to some degree, uh, if it is in fact a self-insert, which kind of sounds like. Um, but there's a reason it was abandoned. Tolkien's own brush with world history had an even more obvious influence on Middle-earth. Faithful servant Sam Gamgee was inspired by the servants who helped officers such as Tolkien in the trenches of World War I, and Sam's journey through the blasted and barren lands of Mordor is an unmistakable image of no man's land. Tolkien's interest extended- Stop it. It's not an allegory. It's, it's very importantly not an allegory. It's not just about uh, it's not just about the trenches of World War One. It's about warfare in general and and what it does to people. Uh, it, it, just because the 20th century had uniquely mechanized and destructive forms of warfare because of this decline of civilization thing, that does not mean that he's talking specifically about World War One. Because of course he's not. Even the inspiration is off. It's not even just. It's not even strictly inspired by it. That that's what, that might would that might be what put his mind to it initially, but but it was a recognition of this is the nature of warfare, not so much the uh, the nature of warfare and the effects of warfare, not so much the effects of this particular war. The same realistically goes to the relationship between Frodo and Sam. Um, yes, fine. It was it was it was inspired directly, I suppose, or again brought to his mind. Um, by uh, by the relationship between officers and their enlisted men in uh, in the Great War, but more fundamentally, it is the relationship between a between a higher and a lower social status uh, social uh, social status men uh, within the context of conflict. This goes back to Homer. Like this is this is the this is the Achilles Patroclus relationship, and don't you dare try and bring sexuality into it because stop it. Stop it. Beyond events themselves and into the development of languages, literature, and legends. The first game seriously to invent languages. About the time I was 13 or 14, I never stopped really. In fact, the exploration of his artificial languages were Tolkien's main concern. Believe it or not, the entire history of Middle-earth is really just a history of the development of Tolkien's constructed languages. Tolkien himself said, the invention of languages is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the languages rather than the reverse. What do you suppose that means? Well, it's quite simple. If you want a friend, just speak the password and the doors will open. It was also a bedtime story for his children. Don't don't forget that too. Um, he d he then so the Hobbit was a bedtime story for his children that he put into this world he, to uh, which he constructed in order to find a place for his languages. They kind of co-developed, but both of these were, I would say, equally important for the development of the mythology of Middle Earth. That yeah, this this started off as a children's story that like a, a story literally for his children for his kids. And then also that sort of fit into and sort of grew out into uh, this world that he constructed to sort of fit his languages into. He constructed the world to fit in these stories, The Hobbit, and then also these various languages that he constructed. That's important too, again, because it, because it speaks to the, again, the importance of storytelling and uh, and the, 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 the use of storytelling and telling stories like this in particular about a great, a great age in the past, say. Um, not necessarily a great age because the Hobbit isn't a, the Hobbit isn't an epic tale. It is a beautiful fairy tale uh, with gorgeous moral, moral lessons as well. But that that context is, I think, again critical to Tolkien's view of history to to look to the uh, the the idyllic past and not just to the present. Um, for our for our inspiration, for our lessons, uh, for our entertainment, even. Anyway, so that's that's another critically important aspect. It's not just about the languages, uh, even if the languages were you know were a major inspiration for the work. 
Tolkien was also fascinated by the historical composition and transmission of the written word, undoubtedly stemming from his work as a specialist in medieval culture. The conceit for Lord of the Rings was that it was his own English translation of a book written by hobbits, the Red Book of Westmarch. Incidentally, this fictional book also has a rich history with no less than five fictional editions, tracing back through writings made by Samwise, Frodo, and Bilbo. So Lord of the Rings isn't meant to be read as a perfect representation of historical events, but as stories that have been passed down, altered, and inevitably corrupted. I wonder if people will ever say, let's hear about Frodo and the Ring, and they'll say, yes, it's one of my favorite stories. So it's safe to say that Tolkien was obsessed with history and the process of writing it. But that's what makes it so strange that his thoughts about history were so radically different from most contemporary historians and laymen alike. Many philosophers of history, especially those popular in Tolkien's time, thought the move from past to future represented some kind of progress. Technologically, we've gotten the wheel, the steam engine, and frozen pizza. And morally, most people would agree that we became a more just society after the adoption of the Bill of Rights, and even more so after the end of slavery, and again after the end of segregation. Martin Luther King summed up this thing. We've become a more just society say what's he contrasting this with that's this is dangerously imprecise because i think that okay to say that we i assume he means like americans but american society barely existed in the the, the mid 18th century like before the bill of rights so yeah maybe he's talking about sort of Western civilization as a whole, but the Bill of Rights didn't really affect that, the Western civilization, all that much. Um, maybe he's talking about the Anglosphere, but again, the Bill of Rights had no effect on Britain, had minimal effect on, say, Canada, no effect at all on, say, Australia. Uh, again, th this has to just be talking about America, and this is, oh, God. Oh no, he's doing the same thing as the other guy. He's got this really weird narrow historical lens that only really thinks that that basically just thinks that history started in the 18th century. Oh, oh no. This this is bugging me. But okay, so so he contextualizes okay, three things. Uh so the Bill of Rights, the abolition of slavery, and then civil rights. Was that it? Let me go back a second. The adoption of the Bill of Rights, and even more so after the end of slavery, and again after the end of segregation. Okay, so segregation. Okay, got it. Got it, got it, got it. All right. I mean, fair. The Bill of Rights was probably a an ethical step forward. I don't think it was an ethical step forward. I'm lying. That's not true. The ending of slavery certainly was. The ending of seg segregation arguably was. Why I say arguably is not because I think segregation was good, uh, but but because it represented a uh, a a weird parasitical arrangement upon the rest of society. That in large part most of society didn't didn't have segregationalist segregationalist impulses. Uh, most of society was was already relatively integrated. The North certainly was just even legally and culturally more or less. There's still some issues in the North. Um, but then the, the 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 South was was integrated was, was disintegrated far more legally speaking than it was culturally speaking. You know, actually, this brings up a point. I think that think that part of what he might be doing here, maybe, is conflating the state with society, conflating legal norms with cultural norms or ethical norms. Would you be careful not to do that? Um, because again, illegal norms don't necessarily track with ethical norms. In fact, they almost certainly don't. Um, for example, and usually I will say that, that ethical norms precede uh, legal norms. Legal, legal norms uh, are, are a trailing indicator, if anything, or a parasitical growth, right? The, 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 um, segregation would not have happened had it not been for a, uh, been for a reconstruction, for example. Um, uh, so Jim Crow laws, in other words, wouldn't have happened without without the Reconstruction era of uh, those were post-war South. Uh, but then we can also point to the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was an assumption already. the 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 the, the specific uh, the specific rights listed in the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution were already assumed to be to exist. The main opposition to the Bill of Rights was not oh no, these are bad, and we shouldn't include these things in here. But the assumption was that by including, the, the opposition was from the anti-federalists, right? The opposition was that by including these specific rights, it might be implied that these are the only rights people possess, uh, or that these rights are 
uh, they can be circumvented by legal fiat if these amendments were themselves amended. Right? The opposition to the Bill of Rights was not to say that, no, we should allow unreasonable searches and seizures, and we shouldn't allow free speech, and whatever, all of them, take your pick. But rather, the opposition to the Bill of Rights, uh, again, was from the Anti-Federalists, the Freedom Party, basically, uh, or at least the, the Decentralization Party. The opposition was that by codifying these things, you place these particular rights into the domain and authority of the federal government, which is bad. If anything, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that came with it was a moral and legal step back from what came before, at least the Articles of Confederation and generally even the, um, the, the state governments under the crown. The state governments under the crown, not the not the parliamentary government of the crown, but the state government certainly under the crown. So no, no, I I, I think that so he's wrong on that. I would also point out that like what what the hell is he comparing this to? To say that the Bill of Rights, uh, the abolition of slavery, and uh, and end of segregation were moral advancements. Okay, over what? Over the norms of the 18th century, maybe, sure, yeah, fine, the 18th century was hell. But over the norms of pre-modernism? The Middle Ages? No. There was basically no slavery in Europe in the Middle Ages. It was introduced as a, as a response to, or as a development of the modern period, not the pre-modern period, the, the period that Tolkien lauded. Segregation as well, that didn't exist. That didn't exist until it was a uh, a, a response to the um, uh, to, to the or not not a response to as part of the sort of Reconstruction era in the Southern United States, the Constitution, these constitutional rights, the the codification of rights, fine. But again, I think the anti federalist critique is solid. But I'll also point out that the rights of individuals was typically tied to their particular communities, which, which have been like in deliberately disintegrated by these large scale legal institutions that we live under today, the big, massive nation states. If you, ah, uh, God, what's the book? Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, a very short book that is, I think even better than Democracy, the God that Failed, which is good, um, but it's a more historical book. It is uh, from aristocracy to monarchy to democracy, a tale of Oh God, what is it? A tale of economic and moral decay or something like that? Where he points out that this the steady decline of how we see our ethical and social relationships uh, leading to the sort of modern de uh, democratic period really kicked off by, uh, by I guess, by the American and French revolutions in, in two different sort of different manners of approaching the same type of uh, type of arrangement. Yeah, uh, the, the, the feudal period of uh, the feudal system, broadly, if we can call it that, let's call it the feudal system, just avoiding the fact that that's, that term is problematic for all sorts of reasons. And I hate using that term unironically, but it fits. Um, but that that system of uh, what Hoppe called aristocracy throughout the Middle Ages, especially throughout the High Middle Ages, was was unparalleled in terms of uh in terms of freedom just because the various levels of uh of power and authority competed with one another in a way that we tried desperately to replicate uh in the constitution among the branches of government but it'll ultimately fail because they're not layered right they're 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 side by side and so they can of course collude their interests are not in competition with one another, so they're not going to compete. They're going to cooperate and collude because, of course, they are, obviously. And so, again, the point here, to go a little bit Tolkien here, maybe this is why I like Hoppe's history, because he does have a little bit of this as history is a kind of steady decline, um, that I think this, this the, the Constitution's attempt at uh, a balance of powers with, uh, with competing interests among the branches of government, including the, both the, the federal and state levels, and then also the branches of the federal government and the, the various individual states competing, etc., the laboratories of liberty and all that, uh, is, I think, a desperate attempt by the founders to imitate something like a feudal system, which was incredibly efficient at maintaining 
uh, maintaining relative liberty over a long period of time, far longer a period of time than we have managed to, than we, uh, we meaning the United States, ever managed to retain liberty because, my God, have we screwed that one up. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, this, so back to, uh, back to Wisecrack. I think he has a very, very narrow view of history. And uh, like most modernists, he has absolutely no conception of the pre-modern world. Uh, certainly not of the Middle Ages. Maybe he's thinking in comparison to like ancient Rome or something ridiculous, but but again, that's just enlightenment nonsense. All right, Let's see where he's going from here. I I'm sorry, I just had to stop at that just because that was I had to talk for ten minutes about it because man, that was off. Some something, something deeply wrong there. Let's move on. Martin Luther King summed up this thinking when he said, the art of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, Tolkien vehemently disagreed. He thought that our technological progress wasn't entirely a good thing and that we weren't progressing morally whatsoever, proclaiming in On Fairy Stories, the way men were living in the 20th century was increasing in barbarity at an alarming rate. While Tolkien acknowledged that- Yeah, obviously. Like, obviously. Look at the 20th century. Tolkien didn't even live through all of it. He died in- 1979, right? No. Yeah. No. 1973. 1973. Because uh, it's the poem of the, the ring backwards. Um, I remember that oddly. Uh, but yeah, he, he made it through three quarters of the 20th century, but not the whole thing. And man, oh man, is he right? <laughs> He was absolutely right that, that humankind has increased in barbarity throughout the 20th century and, and leading up to it, frankly. Um, the 20th century was a horrifying, horrifying dark age when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to education in general. Yes, fine, education became more widespread, but it also tanked in quality uh, compared to the, the 18th and 19th centuries before, and then even compared to the, to the education you would find in the Middle Ages, which was not widespread, but was in immensely sophisticated uh, compared to what we what we have today, which, I mean, most high school graduates can't read. So is it that much better than when most people couldn't read because they didn't get any education? No, because then they didn't waste, waste you know, 12 years of their life. Anyway, 13 or 17, if you include college. Anyway, my point, though, uh, is that this is almost undeniable. Of course, the 20th century was an age of horrific barbarism. Again, the dropping of the nuclear bombs. Need I say more? That technology grew increasingly complex, he mocked the idea that industrialization represented an advancement for society. He witnessed his beloved boyhood home of Serhold despoiled by the encroachment of men and machinery. It's a scene which replays itself during the scouring of the Shire, in which trees are needlessly uprooted to make room for ugly rows of housing, and a pleasant water mill is replaced by one billowing black smoke all over the countryside. In the yeah, um, look at modern architecture and uh, try and refute this. I mean, look, I, yes, there is an element of, of progress, of advancement in technology. The fact that I can do this, right, that I can, I can, I can share information with, with, you know, potentially millions of people, realistically, at least, at least dozens. <laughs> but, but the fact that I can do this sort of thing is evidence of some kind of advancement, uh, the, the, the spreading of human civilization, the, 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 uh, the interconnectedness growing, even the kinds of things that I think Tolkien would admire, but is at the same time being... Look around you. Look at... Hey, let me put it this way. How many buildings from the 1900s are torn down compared to how many buildings from the seven, the nineteen seventies onward. I'm, I, or uh, torn down or abandoned. And put it that way, most buildings from pre nineteen hundred wouldn't be abandoned. They'd be renovated, maybe recovated, but certainly not just abandoned, left to rot. But tons of like sixties, seventies, eighties buildings are just in cities, collecting dust and graffiti. Because no one wants to be there. Uh, uh, there's a great documentary by uh, by another philosopher, um, Sir Roger Scruton, "Why Beauty Matters." He's 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 one of the best uh, philosophers of aesthetics 
uh, since played out. I'm, I'm comfortable saying that. Um, I mean, I'm exaggerating perhaps because I don't, I haven't studied a whole lot of aesthetics, but but it goes like Plato, Boethius, Sir Roger Scruton, give or take. Um, but he's excellent, and this is a fantastic documentary. Again, I will link it in the description. Uh, it, it's very, very good, and uh, it goes into this and talks about modern architecture, and he and he he refers to some of these same issues that Tolkien is pointing out and pointing out absolutely correctly. So. And again, like, so this is a, uh, the, the brief depiction of, in the, uh, in the vision, uh, in Galadriel's mirror of what the scouring of the Shire ought to, uh, would have looked like. And yeah, I mean, it fits with, with, uh, rapid industrialization and, uh, particularly the, the industrialization of the countryside, which, which Tolkien was right to lament. There, there, there's, let me, let me. Let me hit the futurists with their own, uh, with their own hammer here, or hit them with their own weapons. Most futurists, who, who like utopian vision futurists, like the June Roddenberry types, envision a future society where industrialization gets reconcentrated or shoved off somewhere away from society. They don't envision hyper urban civilizations. At least most don't. Uh, they envision something like. Uh, man living in harmony with nature, right? And this is not just because of a weird trend in the 60s and 70s where people became hippies. No, this is because there is something good and beneficial and human about living in harmony with the natural world. And so part of this idea is that when technology gets to a certain point, we will, we will sort of, we won't have to have the, this right we, we can we can cordon off our industrial capacity into designated places places that can be industrial but then the rest of the world can be beautiful can be idyllic can be uh can be natural and we to be fair we're starting to see that sort of thing in some places today kind of a lot of it's still weirdly artificial to be fair uh, but the aesthetics of it is definitely there. Like new buildings will will all, almost always try desperately to mimic uh, naturalistic features, and will try to um, uh, try to integrate with with uh, grasses and trees. And even if it means just sort of uprooting things, plopping them down in a, on a building or next to a building or something, still we try desperately to avoid this stuff because now we're technologically capable of doing it. And so, of course, like the. Tolkien was right, and the futurists will admit it. Not maybe not directly, but implicitly they sure as hell will. Room for ugly rows of housing, and a pleasant water mill is replaced by one billowing black smoke all over the countryside. In The Lost Road, he conflates the human kingdom of Numenor's industrialization with their cultural decay. Our towers grow ever stronger and climb ever higher, but beauty they leave behind upon the earth. Men are ceasing to give love or care for the making of other things for use or delight. In The Hobbit, Tolkien claims that technological development is a symptom of orcish thought, commenting, it's not unlikely that goblins invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once, for wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them. Those wheels and engines were rolled out for the first time in the form of tanks upon the Western Front, where Tolkien at the Battle of the Somme witnessed firsthand the goblin work wrought by the explosive power of modern artillery. Despite the horrors of trench and chemical warfare, many of Tolkien's contemporaries at the time regarded the Great War as emblematic not only of technological progress in the form of more innovative means of mass killing, but as a necessary step in human history for social progress too. Tolkien. Uh, yeah, so I can't actually disagree with any of this. I think he's 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 correctly capturing Tolkien's view here, uh, which is not what I was expecting. I, I was expecting a lot of this to just be terrible, um, but now he's made some serious errors. Um, he's made some serious modernist assumptions, let's say. Uh, but man, uh, he's got some stuff right. Definitely get some stuff right. Um, like I said, I think that uh, I've said before, I don't, I, I don't think that uh, Tolkien is specifically here talking about uh, the Great War in, in any of his works. Because of course he's not. He hates allegory and is insistent upon hating allegory. And allegory here meaning that it, a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between between the symbol and the thing symbolized. He's not talking about symbolism in general. It's, it's that he was fine with. Uh, archetypal symbolism, let's say. But, but yeah, I, I, I do think that it's very hard to praise the First World War 
because it and because it industrialized warfare and then that that sort of spread very quickly into the it, it stratified through society because of course because mass amounts of people were were conscripted enslaved basically uh which is i mean it's hard not to consider that orcish and, and then of course that that follows through to the the um the development and the spread of say the prussian education system and then the, uh, the development of the spread of uh, of not just factory education, but also factory prisons and also factory factories uh, with that sort of very regimented work schedule that is now just sort of starting to break up in some places, but it's still very tightly ingrained within uh, within a lot of parts of our society. King, always the pessimist, disagreed. He believed conflict to be inevitable and recounted years later that this idea arose as a reaction to the contemporary discussions about a war to end all wars. He didn't believe such rhetoric during the war and disliked it even more after it. That conflict must be reminds me um you've heard the song the green fields of france um there's one verse near the end of the song that that almost always brings me to tears if you haven't heard the song you, you should um the high kings has a great recording of it um there's also all it's, it's been covered to death and back but uh, but it's very very good and it's um you know, I'll tell you what, I'll just look it up. Oops. Let's bring this over here. I can't play it, I don't think, because I'm almost certain that it's, uh, uh, that it is, uh, it's going to be copyrighted, but, um, any version of I, any version of it I play will be copyrighted, but... I can't help but wonder, O oh, uh, oh Willie McBride, do all those who lie here know why they died? Did you really believe them when they told you the cause? Did you really believe that this war would end wars? Well, the suffering, the sorrow, the glory, the shame, the killing and dying, it was all done in vain. O oh, Willie McBride, it all happened again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Now, if that isn't an encapsulation of what Tolkien is saying here, I don't know what is. Uh, this is, by the way, the setting of this song, the sort of... the. the the narrative version of the song is somebody's taking a taking a walk in the green fields of France, where a great many people were buried because they had to make impromptu graveyards for the millions of people who died, or who were killed in these battles. I think in the song is where where specifically it's talking about. I could be wrong about that though. Don't quote me on that. Uh, and so he just sits by uh, by some nineteen year old kid's graveside. And uh, starts thinking back on the horrors of the Great War, the most terrible atrocities that human beings have ever committed to each other. Probably the worst thing, the, the, the Great War is probably, probably the worst thing that we as a species have done since we murdered God all those years ago. But, I, I mean, of course... Uh, Tolkien here points out or, over there. Um, so he has this this skepticism of this this grandiose idea, this League of Nations type of idea that we should be we should be trying to we 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 fight this war to end all wars. And then what happens twenty years later? And then twenty years after that, and then ten years after that, and then ten years after that, and then. Well, since I was a small child, what has been happening? Well, the U.S. has been, the U.S. at least, has been at constant war all across the world, nonstop, without a break, without even taking a, taking a break to breathe. It seems to me as if the world is getting worse in these terms. And this great war, this war to end wars, there's never been a more spectacular failure in the history of humankind, I don't think. All wars. He didn't believe such rhetoric during the war and disliked it even more after it. That conflict must be perpetual is part of his idea of history as being cyclical. Instead of there being a straight line from a primitive past to a more civilized future, Tolkien envisions societies throughout the ages all dealing with the same perennial set of circumstances arising from unchanging human nature. Whoa. Well then, that's odd. Because that's not what you said earlier. Um... <laughs> <laughs> earlier, earlier, uh, earlier, you're talking about uh, Tolkien's view of history is not not one of cycles, but of gradual decline, of a prior period of of heightened society, of 
a, a beautiful civilized society now a gradual decline into this mire that we experience now now i will say that this might be this is a more ancient view the cyclical nature of history this is this is something like aristotelian and so maybe it's later high medieval but throughout most of the middle ages so throughout the the period that Tolkien is at least trying to trying to emulate in a lot of his writings, that the the theory of history that that he purport that he puts forward is one of steady gradual decline until the turn, the eucatastrophe, the miraculous turn. And that's really different from a sort of cyclical view of history that uh, that we all go through these sorts of uh, these sorts of conflicts and we all go through the same types of problems and then there's a decline and then a resurgence a decline and a resurgence and that that sort of thing that's very aristotelian that's that's very classical uh, in its view of history that's what the greeks thought that's what mostly mostly the romans thought until later on they started to get this idea of of uh, later in the roman republic around around the sort of julians uh, then you started to get this idea of, of a gradual increase in history, in history, which which is what we see today, uh, the the view of history we see today, not a gradual increase. Um, but then the medieval period, most of the medieval period was very much this idea of that we 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 stand in the ruins of great civilization, that we are carrying the torch of history, this minute little flickering flame keeping what we can alive. That idea. That's Tolkien's view, at least what's embodied in uh, in the, the stories of Middle Earth. Because again, that's what that's what we see in this decline from the the majesty of the first age to the middling glory of the second age, to the barely even worth mentioning third age. So, and I mean, if you compare, say, Gondolin to Numenor to Minas Tirith, Minas Tirith in the Second Age was, was a minor outpost of Numenor. Numenor was this unbelievable civilization of grand power, majesty, size, military might. Everything about it was beyond anything that we could possibly imagine today. It was, it was Atlantis. But it couldn't hold a handle to the ancient elven cities of Beleriand. The, not cities, the civilizations of Beleriand. So Doriath, Gondolin. These were unparalleled, even by Numenor. But the men, of, the men of Numenor could never have even dreamed of having a civilization so mighty as that of Doriath, which was ruled by an immortal king and his... Maya, or basically a goddess of a wife. Or of Gondolin, the impenetrable city inside a, 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 a veil, hidden from all outsiders except those who were invited in, and yet the, uh, one, of the most, one of the grandest collections of wealth and high society and brilliantly high technology that the world had ever seen. For example, uh, the, the three blades that... Uh, that they take from the troll cave in the Hobbit. So, uh, Gandalf's uh, Gandalf's Orchrist. Wait, Gandalf's Glamdring, Thorin's Orchrist, and Bilbo's Sting are made in Gondolin. They were forged thousands of years ago. Now, if you know anything about swords, you have to have one hell of a piece of steel for it to last hundreds of years, let alone thousands. Uh, like the very fact that there are medieval legends and this is carried through to modern fantasy of someone picking up their ancestor's sword and using it for anything other than archaeology should tell you everything you need to know about the view of history that the past was greater than the present could you imagine a modern person picking up their great great grandfather's service weapon 
a modern person who my great great grandfather fought in the revolutionary war i mean it might be a few generations later and i will go to war wielding his musket what the, what the what's wrong with you no that's ridiculous but that's through that's a gap of about 250 years give or take a little little a little bit less but let's say 250 years If you were, if you were in, say, the 12th century, you could perfectly well wield a sword that was very well maintained from at least 100 years prior, maybe even 200 years prior. It was very, it would be very rare to do so, but especially in, among nobles, that was a thing that could happen. This is actually how ancient people thought, pre-modern people, medieval people thought. We don't, we don't think like this because we can't think like this based on our the sort of development of our society in a particular way. Uh, and so again, the, the, this idea that history is cyclical, yeah, that's 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 ancient. For Tolkien, it's the medieval view that we used to have a glorious civilization, and it's since declined. But perhaps someday it can be reignited that spark can come back into a flame that's tolkien's view and I, I don't maybe you can call that sig cyclical because there's a eucatastrophe that brings things back to glory but come on the glory of gondor in the fourth age cannot compare to the glory of numenor which cannot compare to the glory of gondolin it just can't so no there isn't a cyclical nature to tolkien's view of history even if again there's there's merit to it as a view of history and he talks about that sort of thing uh in terms of the the symbolic application of his works sure but but it, but it's not a view of history that he held certainly when we cultures of this all. Many of the events in Middle Earth are meant to be reminiscent of the past. So we have Frodo Nine Fingered in possession of Sauron's ring during the Third Age, aka Lord of the Rings, which resembles another amputee hero from the past, Baron One Handed, who recovers a magic jewel from Sauron's former master in the First Age. But Tolkien is no George Lucas building a second Death Star or J.J. Abrams creating a third, and good God, I hope not a fourth. The repetition of this motif is not the result of a lazy author. <laughs> oh no, you did, but he did more. Oh no, this came out before the Rise of Skywalker. I'm sorry. Thousands of Death Star destroyers. Anyway. Right. So there is sort of echoes throughout history. Sure. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's a kind of... It's not a cycle. It's not a repetition. It's an echo. And the echo is the important part, right? Because an echo is, is something that has sound of its own. It has its own substance. It has its own sort of color and texture from, from its environment and such. But it's an echo of something, and the, the original thing is the more real thing. And that's what that's what Frodo Nine Fingers is to Baron. And that's also, notably, what Aragorn and Arwen are to Baron and Luthien. Baron and Luthien are, um, well, and that's even what Baron and Luthien are to uh, Fingal and Melian. I talked about this in another video, in fact, if you, again, I'll put it in the description, uh, my video on interracial relationships in, in Tolkien's Legendarium. So interracial meaning between different races, different species, if we want to use the term today, not like, not races like white and black, races like elf, man, Maya, that kind of thing. Or even dwarf, if we, if we go with Peter Jackson, uh, Peter Jackson's Hobbit. I bring it up. It's in the video. Check it out. I think it was a pretty good one. Anyway, um, but but again, that's it, it's 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 echoes of the past in the present. It's not just a repetition. It's not cyclical. It's not it's not that history repeats itself. It's that it's that the present is an echo of the past, uh, and the future will be an echo of that echo, etc. 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 And that that necessarily means that there is a sort of diminishment. Uh, as you go forward in time. We're returning to the same well for lack of an original idea. Rather, Frodo bears likeness to Baron because the world they inhabit, though separated by thousands of years, is once again in similar straits. History is repeating itself because it's cyclical. It's not repeating, it's echoing. I, 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 um, to use another Tolkienite example, um, if we if we want to look in terms of like literature and archetypes, you could say that the Christ figure repeats throughout literary history 
uh, or that Tolkien is sort of uh, re-embodying the, the archetypal Christ figure in the, the sort of trio, the triumvirate of uh, priest, prophet, and king uh, in um, uh, Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn. But that's not what's happening. It's an echo. It's it's a kind of it's kind of we have the archetype, which is something like the the form in Platonic terms. But then we have the 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 instantiation of that form in this particular case. But, but it's a layer separated, right? And then we might have layers separated still. We might have we so we have the the, the Christ, the Son, the form of the good, which gets separated and instantiated. Uh, in terms of what Plato would call relationships, thoughts, ideas. Um, and that is the, the trio of priest, prophet, and king, the three roles of Christ, uh, which are embodied in uh, in the Lord of the Rings by uh, Frodo as priest, uh, Gandalf as prophet, Aragorn as king. But then we also have echoes of that in the real world, in the, among real people. Real people embody these roles in our lives, in our societies, in our relationships, etc. And usually not fully, not even close to fully, not even archetypally. We embody these archetypes, which are themselves embodiments of something higher than themselves. This is the same thing that's going on with, uh, with in Tolkien's view, of later historical events. Yes, they, 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 they embody the same thing as ancient history, but ancient history was original. It was first. It was greater. Now we just have echoes. We have the thing that sort of comes along after doing something similar. The eagles are coming. The eagles. The eagles are coming. Well, the history of Middle Earth. That's weird. Because oh God, that's oh, that's such a bad example. That's such a bad example. I mean, yes, the eagles save the day twice in The Hobbit. And then twice in the Lord of the Rings. And the second time it's in in each, it's, it's fairly reminiscent. And the first, it's fairly reminiscent. They they do echo. But so from a literary standpoint, Tolkien's literary standpoint, yeah, they do kind of echo. But that was clearly the inspiration of those scenes in particular was clearly the opposite direction. Right. Because the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy came out way before the Hobbit movie trilogy and was made way before the Hobbit movie trilogy, made by the same guy, primarily, right? Um, that was inserted as a reference because there was no point in the book where Bilbo looks up from the battle and says, the eagles are coming, because that didn't happen in the book because Bilbo was unconscious at the time. <laughs> the whole battle was just narrated from an omniscient perspective because Bilbo was unconscious throughout most of it. So that didn't happen. There was no uh, moment where Bilbo looks up and sees the eagles come in to save the day. That, that Was he unconscious at that point? I think so, but I could be wrong. He it might not have gotten knocked out yet. Um, but the point being is that that didn't happen. That happened because it happened in the Lord of the Rings films. The, the echo goes the other direction here, but it is very clearly an echo. It's an homage, if you want. It, it's not just, oh, well, the same thing happens because cyclical views of it. No, it is, it is a reference. It would be cyclical if... It, it was cyclical in-world, perhaps. But literarily, I think it works much, much, much better in terms of echoes because you can actually see the echo. You can see the original and you can see the thing that sort of is meant to sound sort of like it. Is not simply cyclical. It's cyclical, but always getting worse. These overarching cycles in the history of Middle Earth were broken up into four distinct ages that illustrate history as degradation. Okay, yeah, well, he, okay. But yeah, cyclical, but getting worse is just another way of saying it's, it's declining and echoing. All right. Fine. So maybe everything I said is maybe it was jumping the gun a little bit, but still, I wouldn't call this cyclical. Um, again, it, there, there's much better ways of putting this. He made so far, he made this sound like it's just cyclical that that history repeats itself. He even said history repeats itself, but it doesn't. It, it, it is a gradual state of decline, following roughly the same patterns. 
These bear conspicuous resemblance to Hesiod and Ovid's myths of the Age of Man, in which they establish the now familiar pattern of golden, silver, bronze, and iron ages. In mankind's golden age, perfect people lived in an Edenic state of nature, not dissimilar to the elves in Tolkien's first age coming to live among the gods in the earthly paradise. No. No. N no. The, the first age was a time of incredible conflict. It wasn't an age of of, like, idyllic perfection. But most of the elves stayed behind in Middle-earth. And the ones who didn't... eventually started murdering each other to go back to fight Morgoth. Like, did you read the Silmarillion? This is the first time I've, I've ever heard anyone refer to the First Age that reductively. Because the point isn't that that it was just nicer, right? It was that it was grander. It was greater in scale, in scope. There were wars not between men and men, but wars between gods and gods, between the Valar and Morgoth, between the angels of the Lord and Satan. That was the scope of conflict. And all of this, notably, was an, merely an echo of the music of the Ainur, which was God versus Satan directly. And the entirety of creation is an echo of that moment of creation. Right? Literally an echo, it's, it, it, because it's music. Right? And so, okay. <sighs> yeah, the elves were invited to Valinor by the Valar. But one, they didn't all go. Most of them didn't. Um... And those that did, a lot of them stayed behind in Middle-earth anyway. And those who did go, the, the, it was not a peaceful existence. I mean, it was to some degree. But then a bunch of them went back, the, 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 uh, the kinslaying, right? Banor's, Banor's house went back. Slaughtered the Teleri um, for their ships. It was, it was horrible. Like, the first age was unbelievably wrought with conflict. I, now, don't get me wrong, I freaking love the first age in terms of uh in terms of storytelling man i wish anyone would adapt it com competently uh it's almost impossible to i, I think but, but man the first age had some of the greatest stories because not because they're idyllic but because they're so they're so rich and so high-minded and so 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 grandiose in a way that the stories of later periods just aren't right they're not as grand because you have some of the greatest heroism, but also some of the greatest villains. Like if the second and the third age has Sauron, the first age has Morgoth. If the third age has Smaug, the first age has Alcaligon the Black, greater than a mountain. Like, come on. Come on. You can't just... You can't oversimplify it to that degree. Now, now I could be wrong. I haven't watched this yet. So he could go on right now to say that not only were there great heroes, there were great villains as well. That's possible. And I could have overreacted, but, but man, that's not a good way of introducing this. Not at all. Then succeeded the Silver and Bronze Ages, each progressively worse for man and filled with worse men, followed by the current Iron Age, the most evil... No. 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 There's never been a man worse than Fanor. No. Uh, there's never been a man, man or elf more consumed by pride and hubris and therefore more destructive even in his acts of heroism more destructive than fanor in the first age the 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 most the most prideful acts of the worst kings of numenor pale in comparison to the oath of fanor stop that no this is not a good comparison these four ages are uh, the classical four ages were, were again highly mythological in a way that the Tolkien's legendarium just simply isn't. It is a sort of Edenic golden age, followed by a gradual de degradation in that sense. But it's not a a decrease in the drama of history or the action of history, like Middle Earth is. No, 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 no. People did not get worse. People did not get worse throughout the history of Middle Earth. They got more base. They got um, lower. And even the elves, 
you know, not just not just the transition from the reign of elves in the first and second ages, the first age through the second age into the third age, where primarily we get the rise the rise of men to the fourth age. Um, but no, it's not just that. It's it's that <clears throat> it's that people were it was a decline in drama. Literarily, it was a decline in drama. Let's put it that way. So, no, I think this is a really bad comparison for, I think, pretty dangerously obvious reasons. Evil and unhappy yet. Likewise, across the ages of Middle-earth, there's an overriding entropy, each cycle less mythic and more mundane. There's a grandeur in the past that can be echoed in the later ages, but never fully recaptured. You are a lesser son of greater science. Okay, yeah, that's what I just said, but that's not what he's saying. <laughs> that's... A God, he's got this weird habit of saying something that saying something, me getting mad at it, and then saying the opposite thing <laughs> that I've been ranting about. Because, man, it's this. I think he. Ha I think the problem is that he wants to have this both ways, like a lot. That he wants there to be the cyclical view, but he also wants there to be this decline. He wants there to be a, uh, a danger of technological growth, but he also wants to say, "Hey, we should celebrate it." He wants there to be this this celebration of modernity but he also wants to notice that modernity had problems and it's almost like his view of history is an inversion of tolkien that he thinks that things are getting more interesting more exciting as things go on maybe maybe i don't know i don't know it's a weird trend though because this is the third time this has happened when he said something completely ridiculous and then i could i go crazy about it and then he says something that's roughly equivalent to what I've been ranting about, but poorly and in direct contradiction to what he just said. Uh, I don't know. Consider Rome, a.k.a. the city on seven hills, which Caesar Augustus bragged he left as a city of marble. Yes, the real Rome. Remember, Tolkien's history happens before our own real history. To drive the point home, we learn that many of the cities that preceded Rome also are adorned with marble and have seven of something. But the further back in time we go, the more grandeur we see. In the Third Age, it was the seven-leveled city of Minas Tirith in Gondor. In the Second Age, there was the city of Romana, from which Tolkien implies that Rome derives its name. In the First Age, there was the original and oldest, the seven-gated city of Gondolin. Romana? Is that the city in Numenor? I'm trying to remember, remember the name. But this is a fair point. This is... He's got something here. He's onto it. I like this. But as grand as we know Rome was in its heyday, Tolkien would say it had nothing on Minas Tirith during the reign of King Elisar. And then he would have said, yeah, but this ain't nothing compared to Numenor in its golden age, though he'd probably say it slightly more regally. And King Elros of Numenor would have said to that, y'all should hear my dad talk about Gondolin when Turgon was king before those dragons burned it all down to the ground. Again, more regally. I just said all of this. I said all of this, and I think I just said it better. Like, <laughs> now maybe that's maybe that's me being as hubristic as, uh, well, not as hubristic as Feanor, but maybe a little bit hubristic, but but this contradicts everything that you just said. Oh my gosh, all right, well, okay, continuing on. The point being, for Tolkien, older equals better. Having the same pattern repeat time and again throughout the cycles of history, but becoming progressively a poorer and poorer copy is his way of illustrating that point. Okay. Older equals better. I mean, uh, yes, in some sense, but also no, because we just... He just admitted that there were great, terrible evils in the past that were far greater than anything we face today, or we face, you know, that we face in the Third Age, or they faced in the Third Age. He just got done admitting this, but then goes right back to older equals better, but also wants to say history is cyclical, but also wants to say that it doesn't, it's not cyclical, it's cyclical, but in decline, and... Okay. I'm not I'm not crazy, right? He's contradicting himself like repeatedly. I'm not I'm not insane. I Okay, I really hope I'm not going crazy here. I'm not going crazy, right? He is contradicting himself. It seems like he's contradicting himself. Let, let's let's I'm going to let him go for a little bit maybe. We'll see. We'll see if I get mad again. <laughs> the blood of Numenor is all but spent. His pride and dignity forgotten. Tolkien's portrayal of history can be partially attributed to aesthetics. Tolkien wished to imbue his work with a medieval flavor, and the medieval period is primarily viewed as the ruins of a more glorious antiquity. Because in the history of Middle-earth, each age is inferior to the one which preceded it, its whole history is imbibed with a nostalgia for a past that can never be recovered. Yeah, because that's how the medievals saw their world. It is the medieval worldview. It's not just the aesthetic of 
people living among ancient ruins. That's sure there's an aesthetic there, but that, that, but that has a cultural impact as well. And it's the cultural impact of this view of history in decline. And I think he misses this. I think that to reduce it to simply aesthetics is to reduce the importance of the importance of that aesthetic fact upon the the cultural ideas and values of the people of the people living through the time. I don't know. I think that uh, he's right-ish. He's right to point this out, but I think that he makes the wrong point out of it. Long have I desired to look upon the kings of old. My king. But it's also, as we mentioned, a direct challenge to the myth of progress. Instead, he favors looking backward and appreciating past, perennial, and even eternal matters. It's for this reason that the noble knights of Gondor always look westward before eating each meal. We look toward Numenor that was, and beyond to Elvenholm that is, and to that which is beyond Elvenholm and ever will be. His friend C.S. Lewis coined the term chronological snobbery to describe those who had an irrational preference for anything new over anything old. But he wasn't specifically talking about Gene Roddenberry, but it applies. Uh, this is actually what I... why... Off topic, I know, I'm very sorry. I mentioned I mentioned like Roddenberry-esque futurism and you know chronological snobbery before. Um I didn't use the terms, I should have. Um, but this is uh this is why I I th there's a lot of Star Trek the original series that I, I can't like. And why I absolutely insist that the the next generation era got way better when Roddenberry died lost creative control therefore uh stuff like that i mean because he was the chronological snob because in the early seasons of the next generation for example you get stuff like the like um captain picard just lecturing uh who was the one there was the one episode i can't remember which one it was but the one where um they encounter these these people from cryostasis from the late 20th century or 21st century or something like that. And they're like, uh, they're like obsessed with money and television. And they're like, Oh, we have evolved past such petty needs. We don't use money anymore. It's like, come on guys. It's that kind of thing that, that immediately sees the past as benighted and, and lesser than we are. We're not actually smarter than most of our ancestors. Maybe we're smarter than some of our ancestors. But certainly not all of them. They were people, just like we are. In some ways better, in some ways worse. I, and Professor Tolkien, would certainly argue worse in more ways than better. At least, our best are worse than the best of our ancestors. Put it that way. Tolkien was no mere Debbie Downer. He had an actual philosophy of history that he espoused, one which he and Lewis shared with the medieval minds they spent their careers studying. Middle Earth and the real world are in a constant decline for Tolkien. Hang on. I, I really like how he and Lewis shared with the medieval minds they spent their I love how this is this basically looks like it's my thought bubble up here. Um and I, I really appreciate that my thought bubble is. I believe that's supposed to be Thomas Aquinas, but I'm not sure. Is it? No, it's a bishop's mitre. But Augustine? Not Augustine. It doesn't look like him. I have no idea who that's supposed to be. But either way, I really enjoy that I'm producing this thought bubble. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. career studying. Middle Earth and the real world are in a constant decline for Tolkien because of the way he understands the fundamental nature of reality. Tolkien and Lewis believe that evil was real, not some idea or social construct, but a real and powerful force. Indeed, the most powerful force in the world. Careful. Careful. Neither of them were Manichaean duelists. Both of them understood evil to be a corruption of the good, uh, a, a, uh, a degradation, a privation. Neither of them thought evil was a thing as it wasn't was an essence of its own. If you say the word entropy, I will forgive you because that is a f I mean, it's a bad analogy, but it's an analogy that works in terms of modern modern understanding. But if you say that, I will forgive you. But until then, I mm, careful. You're on thin ice here, bucko. Don't you dare accuse J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis of being Manichaeans because they're not. Now, uh, that is despite the fact that Lewis sort of flirts with Manichaean dualism in, in mere Christianity. 
certainly in Surprise by Joy. But... Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Sometimes Tolkien would portray evil as personalized, as with Sauron, or with Sauron's master from the first age, Morgoth, who... No, no, they're not personifications of evil. That would be nonsensical. The closest thing that... The closest thing that Tolkien gets to a personification of evil is Ungoliant, um, because she's the personification of the Outer Darkness. She's a creature from the Outer Darkness, which seems to be uncreated or something, which is a representation of darkness itself and the uh, the consumption of light and good, which is a representation purely of evil, not of corruption, not of a corrupted thing, but of corruption itself. Ungoliant is the closest thing that you get to pure evil, who, by the way, is the mother of all spiders. And so in Tolkien's mythology, I love this, spiders represent pure evil in a way that should be metaphysically impossible for someone with Tolkien's worldview. That's how much he hated spiders. And I get it. Anyway. Uh, no, th this is this isn't correct. Morgoth nor Sauron are personifications of evil. They're evil persons. They're corrupted persons. Uh, corrupted angels, for that matter. Who was himself more powerful than all the forces of good in the world combined. But also, no. It's not true at all. Like, okay. One, Morgoth was afraid of Tolkas. Uh, Tolkas was one of the Valor. Morgoth was death deathly afraid of him in particular. Two, the Valar and the united forces of the Valar and the elves and uh, all of the elves and most of men were able to defeat Morgoth and Dagor Dagorath. Not Dagor Dagorath, that's the battle at the end of time. In um, the war at the, the, the battle which ended the First Age and sank Beleriand under the sea. Darn. I can't remember it. I can't remember the name. It's Dagor or something. Dagor is the, the Elvish name for battle. Uh, anyway, uh, I could look it up, but I'll just probably put it like over there in the editing room. Um, it's going to bug me, but uh, I might shout it at some point. We'll see. Uh, anyway, that he's defeated, right? Morgoth is defeated. Him and all of his forces are defeated, and he is cast out of the world. He's cast out of being. He doesn't cease to exist. He's cast out of being to basically be to, to exist in the void, in the outer darkness. In hell, practically speaking. Um, beyond this, so not only is Morgoth particularly, specifically afraid of Tolkas, one of the Valar, is defeated by uh, the Valar as a, as a, as a group. Um, but then also, like, beyond any of that, to say that he is more powerful than all of the forces of good combined is to completely neglect Eru Iluvatar. God. Because if either, either, you're saying that God, the creator of all being and the and perfection itself is not on the side of the good, which is blasphemy, or you're saying that Morgoth, stand in for Satan, is more powerful than Eru Iluvatar, God, that's blasphemy too. Either way, no, no, no. I mean, maybe you're saying from a creation, uh, from the standpoint of created beings, in which case you're still wrong, but not as blasphemous. Uh, but man, no, no, this is this is way off. It's not even close. Uh, he was a major threat, but he was a defeatable threat. Tolkien also portrayed evil as an impersonal force, something even the most pure and innocent hearts were capable of being bent towards. Gandalf refuses the ring for that very reason, knowing he could and would be corrupted. And it's worth remembering that when he stood at the cracks of doom, Frodo failed. He abandoned his mission, gave into temptation, and took the ring for himself. This assumes temptation, evil, etc. are things in themselves, which have a force that draws towards them. The closest you'll get to this in anything like Tolkien's Tolkien's, uh, anything like a worldview like Tolkien's, is the view that um, because we are created from nothing, that non-being has a kind of draw on us. That we we, we have a sort of, uh, the nature, our, uh, part of our nature, particularly due to the fall, is to re-disintegrate, re let's say. Uh, Augustine speculated about this, I think. Uh, which I don't think is quite right. I do think that the fall is more more to do with this, this idea of uh, the, the concupiscence and our, our falling away of our falling away from the good, etc. 
Um, but I do think that, 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 that no, this is this is this is making evil out to be like the dark side. And this isn't Star Wars. This is this is not a dualist view. The ring is mine. Tolkien called Earth Morgoth's ring. Just as Sauron poured most of his potency into the One Ring, his master Morgoth poured his spirit throughout the Earth and everything else in existence. So whereas particularized evils like Sauron could be addressed, there is a primordial evil in existence that will remain until the Earth itself is destroyed. It's because of this belief that he stated, I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat. This was what Tolkien originally envisioned as the ending for his Book of Lost Tales. And now, in the end of Fair Times comes very nigh, and behold, all the beauty that was yet on the Earth, fragments of unimagined loveliness, now goeth it all up in smoke. If Yes, but again, that's that is a lament long before the end of things, because the end of all things, aside from that that line being used on the slopes of Mount Doom, the end of all things is Dagger Daggeroth. Yeah, uh, the battle to end all battles. It's basically a Ragnarok esque thing where Morgoth returns to to the world and is defeated once and for all, and Eru comes. Eru Luvatar returns to restore the world. It's basically the Book of Revelation. Uh, it is the Book of Revelation. It's just straightforward. He is, because um, of course it is. It's, it has to correspond to reality, because again, this is part of this is meant to be a mythology for reality. Um, so, oh gosh, um, it's not one long defeat exactly. Morgoth's ring. The idea is that Morgoth corrupted the world that had been created. If you uh, again, I, I have another video on the Ainu Lindale on the, the 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 song of creation, the the act that the act of creation by which God and the angels sang the world into being, Tolkien's creation myth, which is just brilliant. I love that myth. It is, it's almost as true as Genesis. Let's say, just in in a in a more more of an allegorical way. Let's say, but this is um. This view that Morgoth's ring means that there is something that is corrupt about the world is not just Manichaean, it's Gnostic. It's this idea that the world is itself a force of evil. It's not. Morgoth's ring means that Morgoth corrupted the world and made the world less than it ought to have been, but in such a way that God still can, or Iluvatar, can still and ultimately will redeem it. Right? It's not that it must be destroyed, but that it must ultimately be redeemed and made whole very different very very different morgoth's ring the 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 letter morgoth's ring the poem letter I mean, the text morgoth's ring is more complicated than that and there's a lot more to it and it does have a lot to do with the fallenness of the world as such but to this point in particular again i think that, that i think that he's he's going too dualistic about this and of course he is he's a, he's a modernist naturally. The same despondent pessimism is best surmised by Frodo as he lay dying on the cliffside of Mount Doom. It's like things are in the world, hope fails and end comes. We have only a little time to wait now. We are lost in ruin and downfall and there is no escape. But of course, he didn't even say here at the end of all things. He didn't continue the quote. I thought he was going to quote what I just said. Darn it. Okay. But that, that illustrates my point perfectly, which is that that is not a lament at the end of the world. It's a lament at the end of at what he takes to be the end of a story before the eucatastrophe, before the glorious turn. And that glorious turn is absolutely crucial to Tolkien's view of history, because he thinks that those, those things happen, have happened, will happen. Most notably with, with Christ. Like, okay. Do you know when that takes place? The, the date of the, the, um, the defeat of Sauron? The same day as Easter, the same day as the resurrection. It's a, it's a perfect one-on-one -on -one parallel. Because of course it is. It's supposed to be. That's the whole point. Is that this is an an echo, and, and we can look to like the idea that this is an edited version of the Red Book of Westmarch, and it was maybe edited in, in Christian fashion, so maybe the date was moved or whatever. Who cares? Whatever. Yeah, it's it's it is a it's a symbolic instantiation of the same thing, which is the eucatastrophe. It is, it is the miraculous coming, breaking into the world by God for the good, for the creation of the world, for the, for the reinvigoration of things. 
And to to which point, Bruno makes it. He doesn't die. Contra your last point. Frodo lives, and the ring, the stand-in for the inherent evil of the world, is destroyed. So what gives? Was Tolkien chickening out from taking his view of history and evil to their logical conclusion? Did he feel compelled by the conventions of the genre to have a happy ending? Well, that would certainly make sense. What conventions of the genre? He invented the genre. And after all, he did write, I would venture to assert that all complete fairy tales must have the consolation of the happy ending. The you catastrophic tale is the true form of the fairy tale and its highest function. Okay, so, okay, so fairy tale genre. I, I don't know. That's not usually the, the genre we, we include Lord of the Rings in. We think of fantasy as its own separate thing as for, from fairy tale. But okay, fine. He included it in fairy, uh, fairy stories, which... Okay, I'll give him that. Um, but yeah, it's a genre point. It, it's, it's genre defining not because it's the genre, but because it's, it's archetypal. It, it's, it's not archetypal. It's an instantiation of the archetype presented by the world itself. That's Tolkien's view on the matter. When he says something like this, fairy tales must have the eucatastrophic, um, the, the eucatastrophic tale uh, is the true form of fairy tale. Right? It's the form of fairy tale because it's because it is a it's the most idyllic instantiation of the world, and because the world works like that, the fairy tale must, and it must draw attention to it. That's what he's pointing out here. Not that, not that this is a genre convention that he's afraid to bend. Because otherwise he, made, he would have made elves tiny. Come on, elves. He invented elves as we see them today. And that was very much contrary to the, uh, the fairy tale conventions, particularly at the time. Read um, Chesterton, uh, his... Various, uh, his various works on fairy stories, on fairy tales. Um, oh, it's in Orthodoxy, I think. It might be on it might be in Heresies on Elfland, right? the ethics of Elfland, things like that. All right, continuing. Of all the many words in the many languages that Tolkien invented, this word, you catastrophe, is undoubtedly the most important. He defines it, in its fairy tale setting, a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur. It does not deny the existence of this catastrophe of sorrow and failure. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world. So basically... Oh, wait, uh, actually, hold on, let me let him finish this. Everything will continue to go to shit, but there will be a sudden change toward good fortune that works against this dire conclusion. Now, Okay, so what he's saying here, I hope, is that everything he's saying so far has been wrong, and that Tolkien's view of history is not a gradual degradation until everything turns to shit. It is, in fact, a gradual degradation until everything is reconciled. It's a good, happy ending, because that's the entire point of Tolkien's view of history, is that the world has a happy ending, and so stories should as well. And I absolutely agree with this but from a from a historical perspective that yeah everything everything kind of goes bad a lot, um, but then also everything that everything has a happy ending. Christ wins, but then also not just Christ wins, but that 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 means that a good story has a happy ending. Like I don't this is why I don't like stories with downer endings. Well, I don't like downer stories at all. I, I because they're not they're not real. The real world is one of you catastrophe. It is one of one of joy, one of a glorious resolution and a, and a glorious intervention of the good into the bad of the world. And that's something that Tolkien, I think, points to. And that's why we love Tolkien's writing so much. That's why we love The Lord of the Rings is because it is the kind of story that we understand to be the nature of the world, but we, but we can't quite see in our real lives. Now, beyond the walls of the world here is telling. Tolkien alludes to another force, as Gandalf hints to Frodo. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that doesn't encourage your thought. Later, Agent Smith, doing his best Morpheus impression, elaborates, You have come and are met here in the very nick of time, by chance, so it seems. Yet it is not so. Believe rather that it is ordered that we, who sit here, and none others, must now find counsel for the perils of the world. Yeah, um, this was something that I think the movies got horribly wrong because it implies that the Council of Elrond was summoned by Elrond. They were not. All the members of the Council 
were there for their own reasons and happened to be at the same time. It is, from this quote, directly implied that it was Providence, that it was the Eru Lubitar. So, excellent. Very good use of this quote. Spot on. Uh, I hope you're not going to go some weird direction with this, but... Um, <laughs> who knows at this point? Uh, but... This was actually one of the things that I think was was a uh, was a missed opportunity, dropped the ball uh, in Peter Jackson's adaptations. That it's very heavily implied that Elrond called the council, which he did. He didn't. This council didn't exist. There was no council between men, elves, and dwarves. That's ridiculous. The White Council were, were the ring bearers, the the bearers of the three elven rings. That was the White Council. It was. Uh, so it was uh, Galadriel, Elrond, and uh, originally. Kurnir? No, not Kurnir. Círdan, uh, who gave it to Gandalf, which is why Gandalf is part of the White Council. It was, the, it was a council of ring bearers and ring lore. Anyway, moving on. Let's see what he does with this. So something is driving history toward a goal. This kind of eucatastrophe isn't limited to fictional stories. Tolkien thought that real history contains a fairy story, or a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. As such, Tolkien envisioned the end of history as being likewise eucatastrophic, that though history would be nothing more than the long defeat, it would ultimately have a happy ending as unexpected as the eagles arriving at Mount Doom. Not just that, but that it happens throughout history as well. The eucatastrophe is not a one-time, a once-and-for-all thing. It is, but it also occurs throughout history. That's what, that's what the, the, I mean, that's what, the incarnation was but it's also what the apocalypse is the apocalypse is hell on earth redeemed to the millennium that's what that's what he's getting at here and that that does happen periodically throughout history it's not uh, not periodically that implies a, a certain regularity to it but according to god's will throughout history remember christ wins in the end and that is the fundamental christian worldview it's not just tolkien Ultimately, this was grounded in what Tolkien called Estelle. More than merely being Aragorn's elvish name, Estelle was one of the two elvish words meaning hope, which also meant trust. All throughout life, Tolkien looked around the world and between the scouring of his own boyhood shire, his living through a veritable Mordor in the trenches of the Western Front, and later while writing Lord of the Rings, witnessing the rise of real Dark Lords in Hitler and Stalin, Tolkien had no reason to look up and reasonably expect good. And yet, through it all, he never faltered in Estelle, in trust. Just as Tolkien's writing awakened an appreciation of the past among the chronological snobs that had been so enamored by modernity, so too do his myths stir something in us that certainly hopes for there to be real good in the end. When we read The Silmarillion or The Hobbit or most especially Lord of the Rings, we're all like Sam, in the black of night in the enemy's own land, struck by the beauty of a white star twinkling above him. There, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope returned to him, for like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing, that there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the virtue of hope. Right, so, so, this is a theological virtue. Like, this is what the theological virtue of hope means in the, in the, the scholastic context that Tolkien was very, very familiar with. It's the idea that that we are to understand that despite difficulties and troubles and, and the tribulations of the time, that God wins. Right? We have to remember that, and that that's that's a virtue. Remembering that is a virtue. It's an intellectual virtue. It's a virtue of grace. It's a supernatural gift. And that that gift is, I think part of what Tolkien was giving or was trying to give in these stories. Pray for his beatification. I, I, this, 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 this point, this, this passage and, and passages like it and the, these parts of the works of Tolkien are practically miraculous. And the effects that these have had on people, I really do think that they are that it's miraculous divine hope. May we pray through, through Tolkien's intercession. Anyway, that's all I've got. The rest of this is just outro. And so I'll do my outro here as well. Um, thank you for listening. I had a good time. This was not nearly as bad as I was told, but it was pretty bad. And I had a lot to say about it. Um, so 
thank you for uh, for going through this uh, with me for this hour and a half ish. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, whether the original video or my commentary on it, or maybe a little of both. And um, I hope that we've we've learned something, explored some of these topics, uh, maybe a little better than the original video did, uh, and that we uh, we can take something away from this worthwhile. Anyway, thank you all once more for joining me on on one of these response video adventures. Remember, don't be safe. Be well, and more importantly, be good. See you next time, everybody.